Welcome to chapter 5. So we're skipping chapter 4 for the moment. We'll come back to it later. It's not um, a building chapter. Chapter 5 is really internal controls and cash, so we can cover it at any point in time, but we only have a couple weeks till our next exam. So we're going to cover chapters 5 and 6, and that will be all that's on the next exam coming up. In chapter 5, we begin looking at receivables, and then we'll look more at merchandising companies. But to begin, let's start with just the receivable. And we've talked about accounts receivable, but let's define again what accounts receivable, uh, what accounts receivables are, um, so that we have a better understanding of what creates them. So an account receivable is created through the, and of course, that would be the sell of goods. So we sell a good on accounts, on account, I keep wanting to pluralize that, sorry. So we sell a good on account, it creates the receivable because we give the good to our customer, but they have not yet paid us. So when they owe us money, we call that an account receivable. So it's either through the sale of goods or the performance of services on account. So that's really what creates the account receivable. Now there's other types of receivables as well. There's notes receivables, there's trade receivables, etc. But accounts receivables specifically are created through the sale of goods or performance of service. Now. In the life cycle of receivable, that is its beginning. That's basically its birth there. It's created at that point in time. And when that happens, we debit the accounts receivable account. Now, I will say that I do allow abbreviations in this case. So AR is universal for accounts receivable. So if you want to start abbreviating that AR, you're more than welcome to, as long as you understand what that means. Now, what created the accounts receivable? Well, we create an account receivable by the sales of goods, by the sale of goods, or through the performance of services. Now, when we sell goods, we consider that sales revenue. So, in that case, we would credit sales revenue. Or, if you perform the service, as you know, anytime we perform a service, we get to recognize the revenue. Remember, per revenue recognition, we get to recognize revenue when the service obligation is complete. And again, that is the basic, basic concept of revenue recognition. There's more to it than that, but that's the basic concept that I want you to understand at this point. So now, we've got our debit, we've got our credit, either sales revenue or service revenue. Now once a, an account receivable, excuse me, is created, we really have to go through the rest of the life because once it's created, something has to happen to it. It can't just sit there indefinitely. And there's really three primary things. Now, there's other things we can do to it, like selling it out, factoring it. Um, but there's, there's only three things that we're going to look at after that point. And those are called reduction of the receivable. So you put the receivable on, you debit the account. Once it's on there, eventually it has to go away. And there's really three ways in which we can do that. The first thing that we can do is we can have a return. So first thing that can happen is our customer can return the goods to us. And once they return the goods to us, that reduces the amount they owe because we don't require them to pay for goods that they've returned. Now the second possibility is we can actually have a collection which is really our goal. If we sell something on account, we really want to collect that payment. So that second possibility is a collection. And then third, we can deem the account uncollectible. Now, uncollectible account simply means we're never going to get those funds. We don't expect our customer to ever pay us for the goods or the service. And that's different reasons. The customer just refuses or the customer goes bankrupt. There's different ways. Sometimes customers just do not pay for the goods they purchase or the services. So that's the third possibility in collectible. And we'll talk about that here in just a little bit. So let's start with the return. The returns occur when the good is returned to us. Now services aren't that easy to return. Obviously, if you mow someone's yard, you've got an issue. If they're not happy with it, you may discount the rate or you may give a, a, a correction um, to fix the problem. So it's really hard to have a return in that case. But when we're talking about the sale of a good, we can't have a return. Now, when we have a return from our customers, of course, the receivable is going down because it causes a reduction. So we know in that case, we're going to actually credit the account's receivable account. Now, what do we debit? Well, our reaction would be, well, they no longer have the good, so sales revenue. And that's... a really a valid assumption, but it is not correct in that case because what we want to do is hit a contra account called sales returns. 
Now remember those chart of accounts that we've been dealing with, we're just going to keep adding to it. That's the reason it's crucial that you understand the first unit. So a sales returns account, sales returns account, sales return would sound better. So let's fix that. But that type of account is a contra revenue. So it goes in the revenue section of the income statement, hence the revenue piece. But it goes against the revenues, hence the word contra. So it's a contra revenue. Again, we're going to add contra revenues. We've already dealt a little bit with contra assets and accumulated depreciation. But now we're adding a contra revenue. So the account sales return um, is just that. They brought the goods back to us. It's a contra revenue. It will offset the sales revenue account on the income statement so that we can see that. Now, why do we do that? Well, it's really for a tracking mechanism, so we can really see how much of our product is coming back to us. And if that number becomes uh, too high, it should be a, a warning or a flag that something's going on. Either your salespeople are being pushy in products they shouldn't be, um, or maybe your suppliers are sending bad, uh, poor quality uh, products to you, so they're getting brought back. So different reasons, but that's really an account we just want to, to test for watch out for so that we can make sure our returns do not get too large. So we're going to track those in a contra revenue account called sales return. Now on to the allowances. Now we said they can actually return the good. Sometimes an allowance occurs, and this is definitely true for um, services, where we just say, okay, look, sorry you're not happy, let me give you an allowance, I'll give you so much back, uh, if that'll rectify the issue, things of that nature. Or it may be one of those cases where we say, okay, if you'll keep that product, I'll give you an additional 10% off. Say it was a blue when you wanted a white. And you say, well, you know, for a cheaper price, I'll keep the blue. Uh, that's what a sales allowance is. It's treated very much like a sales return in that it does reduce the amount our customer owes us. Now, we are not going to get the product back, though. So the accounts receivable is the credit. It's going to go down, but we're not getting the product back. We're just giving them a discount on the product. So what we'll hit is an account called sales allowance or sales allowances. Now what that allows us to do again is tr to track those. Sales allowances is a contra revenue, but it allows us to keep that product sold by just giving them a discount. Sometimes it's very difficult to resell a product that's been sold once. Um, so when they want to bring that back, it, Sometimes we'll offer the allowance so that they'll keep the product and we just reduce the price. So again, my example there, you purchase a t-shirt for $100. It was the wrong type of t-shirt or slightly wrong color. So I'll come in and say, hey, if you'll keep it, I'll give you 30% off. So I'll give you $30 back if you'll just keep that shirt. And sometimes we'll say, sure, that's a sales allowance. Okay, it's not a return. We don't get the good back. Um, we just simply discount the price on a sale that's already been made. Now, if you go into a store and you just purchase an item already discounted, it would not be recorded as an allowance. So say you go into Belk, they're notorious for sales, right? So you go into Belk and you see a, a sticker item that's $50 and it says right now it's 50% off, so it's $25. Well, when Belk rings that up, they actually ring the sales revenue up at 25, the actual sales price of the good, not the manufacturer retail price. A sales allowance would occur if you left with that product and you came back and they say, okay, if you'll keep it, we'll give you an additional and they refund you an additional 10% or additional 20% or whatever it is, that refund amount, that's the sales allowance. We reduce it by that amount. Now, I know that's not a receivable in this case, but it's sort of that same concept of how we would record that instance. So it's, this is not just a sales, um, what am I trying to say here? It's, it, it's not a trade discount. Um, it's not on sale, for example. It's just you saying, I'll give you some money back. You've already recorded the sale. Um, at the original price, so you just allowance it back down. So keep that in mind. It's a little bit different scenario. All right. Now, the next thing that can happen is a collection, and really this is what we hope happens. We really want to sell the good or perform the service. Our customer turns around and sells, uh, pays us within a respectable amount of time. So when that happens, there's two possibilities. We can either do it in a discount period or outside a discount period. Now, what does that mean? 
Well, when we sell on account, sometimes you'll see credit terms. And you can look through, and we'll look at an example here in a minute, like 2, 10, and 30. Um, that really indicates that the net, uh, the 2% uh, discount in 10 days, or the net is due in 30. So let's scroll down here to our creation and collection. So notice <clears throat> on page two, again, we'll work this here in a minute. I just want to bring your attention to this. We uh, sold 3,000 of honey detection services to Tigger on account where it has terms 210 and 30 here. This is credit or discount terms, excuse me, or credit terms. So you get a 2% discount if paid within 10 days. Otherwise, the net of the bill is due in 30 days. Um, so it really just sort of helps us understand that, hey, if you pay me early, I'll give you a discount. And there's really great benefit to that. The reason being, you're like, well, that's only 2%. It's not that big of an uh, amount. That's a 2% return in 10 days. It's like over a 30% annual return on investment. It's well worth it, and it's a big number. So if you really take advantage of all of those discounts, you can save a lot of money. And then you may be asking, well, why would the company offer it? Well, time is money, right? The sooner we get our money, the better off we are. Because um, then we can use those funds to generate more funds in some means. So it's very important to us, too, to get that. And, and again, 2%, you're like, well, that's not a big number. And it's not on my end, but it ensures sometimes a very timely payment. And every day that passes without payment, you lose money, in essence. Okay, so that's the reason we offer that anyway. All right, so that's what a discount period is. So there's really two entries here. Either they pay within the 10 days or they pay after the 10 days or they never pay, which is uncollectible. We'll talk about that in a few moments. But here, if they pay within the discount period, we're going to receive cash. They paid us, the cash is going to come into our company. Now, the cash will come in at the discounted amount. So in this case, let's say our bill was $100. It's a 210 in 30 discount rate. So 2% in 10 days, that would actually be a $2 discount. So on the 100, they have to pay us 98. So the cash would go in at 98. The problem is the accounts receivable needs to be reduced. Well, when they pay us the 98, even though they owe us $100, we're going to remove the account receivable at the full amount, the full $100. Well, that's going to leave us a $2 issue. Remember, debits must equal credit, so now we got a $2 issue. So where do we put it? Well, we create an account called Sales Discounts. Okay? Oops, sorry about that. We create an account called Sales Discounts. Now, that, that again is a contra Revenue account is going to reduce our revenues just like sales allowances and just like sales returns. So it's going to be a contra revenue account. It shows up on the income statement. It reduces. But that's the, the $100 in receivable. We're going to get $98 in cash. That leaves us $2 in sales discounts. So that's what happens if we pay within the discount period or they pay us within the discount period. Now what happens if they wait till after that 10-day window? Well, in that case, it's just a normal collection, which you've done. You collect on account where our cash would go up by the full $100 in our example, right? And then we would simply reduce the accounts receivable by that same $100. And that sort of takes care of that um, issue. So inside the discount period, we do have to take into account that, in this case, 2%. Now, discount terms are not always 210 and 30. I have people that think that. It could be 110 and 30 or 510 in 30 it's whatever percentage you're willing to give off to um, really get them to pay you early okay so to I use 210 a lot because 2 percent is easy but you may see 110 you may see 215 some extend it for 15 days just again to encourage that oh pardon me I'm sorry I had to yell there um, to encourage that earlier quick payment so we've looked at the creation of a receivable then we've turned around and we've looked at what happens when they return it or we give them an allowance. Then we've looked at a collection. Now we need to move into what's called the uncollectible account. Now uncollectible simply means we're never going to see those funds, or at least in our opinion, we're never going to see them. And there's two primary methods we can account for this. And the first method is the direct write-off method. Now we do have to be careful here in that the direct write-off method, while it is allowed in certain situations, is not actually a gap method, which means if you're gap bound, 
and your write-offs are material, you could not use this method. So what method is GAP? Well, that brings us to the next method, and that's called the allowance method. Now, the allowance method is the only GAP approved me uh, method. So uh, only the allowance method is GAP, which stands for Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. So it's the only one that sort of follows that rule. Okay. However, the direct write-off is used if your write-offs are immaterial, very, very small, or if you're not a public company. So let's really talk about the difference. The direct write-off method writes off an account when it is physically deemed uncollectible. So when we go in to write off the account, again, writing off the account means you're getting rid of the receivable. So you're going to credit the account's receivable. Now, what we're going to turn around and do then is we're going to debit bad debt expense. Under the direct write-off method, we recognize bad debt expense when we actually deem the account uncollectible. It doesn't matter year in, doesn't matter any of that, timing doesn't matter. What does that mean? Well, we have a new account. Now, we're not going to write it off immediately. We're going to assume for as long as possible they are going to pay us. So we go in, we record the receivable. Eventually, I don't know, whatever your company's policy is, 180 days later, they still haven't paid you, nine months later, or do you wait a full year later? Whatever your company policy is, at some point, you're going to have exhausted all of the possible options for collection. And once you've exhausted all of those possibilities, you're going to write off that account. Now let me just detail why this isn't really GAP. Um, and, and you know, let's I'm going to scroll down here and just create a new page for us and sort of walk you through why this would not be a GAP method. Let's say in November and December you have, I don't know, 500,000 in sales on account. So during that time frame, you sold 500000 on account. Well, what's the odds with, by December 31st that you would actually have written off any of the accounts that you sold there? Let's say that's to, you know, you had 500 customers or 5,000 customers or 100,000 customers or whatever it is. You have all these customers you sold to on account. By December 31st, will you know which of those customers will actually not pay? Remember, at this point, what are we, 60 days in? Now, most companies are not going to write off an account after 60 days. They're going to try their best to collect it. So it may be a little bit longer, 180 days, 9 months, whatever your company policy is. But here's the problem. Let's just assume that this is 2017. Now, let's assume, again, December 31st is 60 or some days, within 60 days. So whatever you sold in November and December, of course, it's less than 60. But at most, you would have 60 days out. So then let's say at some point in the future, let's just say our company says June 1st. On June 1st, and here's the problem, 2019, you say, hey, this account is uncollectible. Well, you're going to debit bad debt expense on that day. For whatever the account is, let's say that it was one customer for a thousand bucks. That's not the important piece here. And then you're going to go ahead and you're going to get rid of the account receivable. Now, let's go back to that definition, revenue recognition. And I told you in unit one, this would come back to haunt you if you didn't learn what these two are. But revenue recognition and expense recognition. Remember, revenue recognition states we recognize revenue in the period the service obligation is complete. Now. That can be um, once you sell a good, it can be once you perform a service, whatever your obligation is to your customer. Once that's complete, we get to recognize revenue. Now, the expense recognition states, hey, you must recognize expenses in the time period in which they assist you in generating revenues. So stop and, and really mull that over in your mind. When did this bad debt, this thousand dollars, when did it generate revenue for us? Well, the answer is it generated revenue in 2017, and I put 2019 here, geez, let's put 2018. But anyway, it generated revenue in 2017. In 2018, 
Should we recognize expenses for revenues that were generated last year? And the answer is really no, unless it's just an immaterial number. We really shouldn't be doing that. So somehow we had to come up with a method where bad debt expense would actually be recorded in the proper period, which means somehow, even though I don't know what the amount is, right? I sold 500,000 of goods. I do not know as a company which ones would be bad. If I knew at the time of sale it would be a bad account, I probably wouldn't make the sale. But sometime, as of December 31st, we need to go ahead and record the bad debt expense. What that allows us to do then, instead of recognizing this bad debt expense in 2018, it would go ahead and move it into 2017 where it actually belongs. Um, that is sort of an issue that we had to fix with the, bad, uh, the direct write-off method. So let's go back up here and let's talk about that. Well, since the direct write-off method is not GAAP, we look at the allowance method. Now, the allowance method has two stages of the process. The first stage is the year in adjusting entry. Remember I said, hey, we've got to figure out how to get the bad debt expense into the proper year. This is how. In the allowance method, what we're going to do on December 31st is we're going to go ahead and, and debit the bad debt expense for whatever we think will be uncollectible. Now, during the adjusting process, I want to make it very clear that this is an estimated amount. We're actually estimating how much in bad debt expenses we're going to have. We debit the bad debt expense for whatever that estimate is. Now, when we credit, we have to be careful here. We don't want to credit accounts receivable yet. That 500000 we want to sit there as long as possible until we just know for a fact they're not going to pay us. So what we did is we created the allowance for doubtful accounts. Sometimes you'll hear that allowance for uncollectible accounts. I really use them interchangeably, but it's the same concept. Now, again, we're throwing a lot of new accounts at you, and I told you we would as we go through this semester, but the allowance for doubtful accounts is, again, one of those odd contract accounts. It goes against the receivables to give you a net realizable value. So net realizable value, take a note on this, net realizable value or net cash value is simply the receivable, the accounts receivable, less or minus the allowance for doubtful accounts balance. That gives us what we call uh, the net realizable value. So make sure you take a note of that. It's very important. Now, that's one step in the process. We estimate bad debts. We put them on our books. So now, at least with that 500000 in sales, I have matched all the bad debt expense that I anticipate, or at least enough that it is within reason and not to have a material issue or material difference, okay? Now, next year in 2018, when I decide to write this off, I am then going to debit the allowance account. I don't want to hit bad debt expense again. I want to hit, oh, I keep hitting the wrong key. I want to go in and hit the actual allowance account to reduce it. And then I'm going to go in and I'm going to credit. Now here's where I actually reduce the receivable. Only when the account is being written off. It is deemed that we will never see the money for this account. We write that account off. So let's go back to my $500,000 example down here that we were looking at. So let, let's make this a little bit easier. Let's just say December of 2017, we sold 500000 on account. Well, what we would do then is we would debit the accounts receivable for the 500000 Left out my E there. Hold on one second. Fix that. So we're going to hit that for the 500000 Then we're going to go in and we sold goods, so we're going to hit the sales revenue account. Now, December 31st rolls around of that year, so December 31st, 2017. What we have to do at that point is say, okay, do I anticipate any of my accounts being bad? Well, when I look back over time, I realize, hey, typically speaking, of my credit sales, the amount that's remaining, so much of it is uncollectible, okay? And we're not going to talk about how we get that yet. We will, but not right this second. Once we do that, Let's in this case say that we think $1,000 will be uncollectible. 
we go in and even though it's an estimate we go ahead and record our thousand dollars now we get that estimate from past history or industry standards we look and see how much historically have we had in returns when we have sales and say it's one percent or two percent or whatever it comes out to that sort of becomes our baseline then we're going to go ahead again we're not writing off any receivables yet we're going to hit it into the allowance for doubtful accounts for that same one thousand dollars notice all the expense of selling on credit we're putting in the same period as the generated revenues right these are the receivables that generated this revenue of 500,000. This is those receivables that will not be collected, or we expect not to be collected. So notice we're matching the revenue and the expense in the right time period. That is why this is gap and the other method is not. Now, back to when we wrote it off. Remember we said, hey, we wrote it off in June. Well, under the allowance method, what we would do then is pull it against the actual contra account. Now, they don't want us to call that a reserve, and I understand that. So let's say a $200 account was unclicked. And then we go in and we actually credit the accounts receivable for that same 200 So that sort of shows us, hey, you're never going to collect it. We're writing off this account here, but it goes against the allowance. So now we've got the, the two-step process in recognizing bad debts for the allowance method. A year in adjustment that records all the bad debt expense. And then throughout the year, as we actually deem accounts uncollectible from that $500,000 sale, we will simply write them off. Now, being that this is an estimate, okay, we may not be right. Some years you have more returns than others. It can sort of be a fluctuating number. But at any rate, we realize that that is our anticipated amount. Now, allowance for doubtful accounts, again, is a contra asset so it goes against the receivables of our company it is also sort of a holding place it holds back the actual amount so when we show this on the balance sheet we actually show the receivables and then we net it with the allowance just like we did when we created the balance sheet with the equipment and the accumulated depreciation the allowance for doubtful accounts always goes against receivables now the allowance should have a normal credit balance. That's what actually makes the account go up because it is a contra asset. Um, however, depending on how much you write off, sometimes this may be a debit throughout the year, but the normal balance should be a credit. Okay, so that's what that is. Now, again, I gave you that definition, so let me just go down here and write this in. Net realizable value. Also, you may see that net cash value. It really just depends, but um, net realizable is sort of a formal term for it. That equals the accounts receivable of the company minus the allowance for doubtful accounts. Selling on credit creates bad debts, usually. So you've got to account for them. Okay? All right. So that's really the two-step process. So in this, what we've looked at so far, we looked at the creation. When we create a receivable, we debit the receivable, we credit the revenue source, either the sales or the service revenue. Then, once we have it, there's three things that can reduce it. Either return or, I guess I really say a return or allowance. Both of those could work. Sorry, I should have put that in there. But return or allowance, a collection, or by simply deeming the account uncollectible. When we have a return, we debit sales returns, which is actually a contra revenue account. We credit the receivable because we're reducing the receivable. Again, all these are reductions to our receivable, so they're all going to be credits. Then we have the allowance, and again, I explained what an allowance was. It's where you actually say, hey, if you'll keep it, I'll give you 10% back or 10% off again. Um, they've already bought the good. You're just trying to get them uh, to uh, incentivize them, I guess is the best word, so that they don't return it. So a uh, sales allowance, again, is a contra revenue account, and again, this is a reduction of receivable. Then we have the collection, and remember we learned the terms 210 and 30. If it's within the 10 days, or within the credit terms, whether it's 210, 110, 610, whatever, we're actually going to record cash at the discounted price. So in my example, it's $100. We had a 2% discount, so we would record the cash at 98. Then 
the two dollars would go into the sales discounts account and again sales discounts is a contra revenue as well it would show up in the revenue section on the income statement but it would reduce us so it should have a debit balance because it is a contra revenue that would be the two dollars so cash 98 sales discounts two the receivable since the customer owed us a full hundred thousand they would put us in at a hundred thousand for the receivable or hundred dollars excuse me hundred thousand hundred dollars that's within the discount period. Now, if they were outside the discount period, they would debit cash and credit accounts receivable. Then the last way we can reduce a receivable is through uncollectible accounts. Again, there's two methods, the direct write-off method and the allowance method. Only the allowance method is GAAP. Direct write-off is not. But I want you to see, under direct write-off, it does happen sometimes, especially if you work for a smaller company. We go in and we debit by debt expense and we credit the receivable. Again, it, there is a potential here where we don't match the revenue recognition principle. We're not matching the revenue or the expense there um, in the same time period. So that's an issue. So that's why we generated the allowance method. And in the allowance method, we have a two-step process at the end of the period. We debit bad debt expense and credit the allowance for doubtful accounts um, for whatever estimated amount we have in bad debts. Then, as we deem an account uncollectible, then we'll pull from that information and we would debit the allowance and credit the receivable. All right, so we're at 31 minutes and I'm trying to make up for a 50 minute class. So let's go over these examples here. So, number one, when Winnie the Pooh Corporation sells 300,000 of honey detection services on account to Tigger Company, Pooh offers Tigger 210 and 30. Again, that's our credit terms, a 2% discount 10 days, otherwise the net's due in 30. Now, we really don't have any dates, so I'm just going to put a 1 there. So Winnie the Pooh, or Winnie Pooh, excuse me, got to watch the copyright there. Winnie Pooh actually goes in, and they sold goods to Honey Detection, or Honey Detection Services, not goods, services, to credit, um, on credit to Tigger. So here we're creating the receivable because they actually, you know, sold goods on account. We know that it says on credit, but if it didn't, we do have credit terms, which are very important. So we're going to debit the accounts receivable, and we're actually going to go in and we're going to credit the service revenue in this case. Oh, no. Yeah. All right. on credit so these are maps so it would be sales because we actually sold maps honey detection okay and plus he's going to return some of them so he's actually got a good going on here so it's going to be sales revenue sorry I had to think for a moment there it's late and I'm tired it's been a long weekend all right so there's 3,000 now Tigger returns 500 of goods to Winnie Pooh due to issues in the packaging so again this is an example of return and when we return the goods, we're going to actually hit an account called sales returns. So that way it actually comes in. Now, sometimes they'll combine sales returns and allowances into one account. Our book keeps them separate. You can combine them into one account called sales returns allowances, either way. So we're going to debit that for the amount of goods that they return, 500. And we're going to actually go in and credit the accounts receivable because they do not owe us of the $500 for the goods that they return. Now, number three, Tigger received a wrong honey map for a thousand and wants to send the map back. So in other words, you know, we, we provide these maps and he ordered the easy map so that he can easily find honey. Um, but this map was a more difficult and challenging course. So maybe he had to hike up a mountain or something like that. And Ticker really didn't want that. He didn't want to have to hike them around. So he was going to return this map for a replacement so he can get an easy one. It costs $1,000. Pooh really doesn't want him to return this map. It's an older map. He just wants rid of it. Okay, so he tells Ticker that if he will keep the wrong map, he will only charge him $500, which means he's getting a 50% reduction in price. Ticker agreed to the terms. So what happens? Well, we don't have a return here, so we're going to hit sales allowances for the amount of the discount. In this case, it's 500. Um, then we're going to go in 
and we're going to actually credit the accounts receivable because again, if I give ticker an allowance, he does not owe me that $500, okay? So that's an example of a, cre a creation, a sales return, and a sales allowance. Now the last thing we're gonna look at here is what if, what if Tigger pays, which is, is a collection and we hope he does pay. So number four says, well, what if he pays his bill in nine days? What would Pooh's journal entry be? So again, Tigger is paying us, so we know we're gonna get cash. Now we need to figure out how much in cash we're going to get. So if we scroll up here, notice originally we sold Tigger $3,000 worth of product. Now that's not what he owes us at this point though, because Tigger did two things. One, Tigger returned 500, so now we're at 2,500, because notice we debited receivable here for three, we credited for five, so we have a total of 2,500 left. But then we offered an allowance of five, which also reduced receivable. So you take 2,000, or excuse me, 3,000 was the original, subtract out the 500 return and the 500 allowance. So right now, um, Tigger owes us two thousand dollars. Well, is he going to get all? Or are we going to receive all two? And the answer is absolutely not, because at nine days he is still within the discount period. And since we are in that discount period, we need to give two percent off. So what we would do, and we only give a discount on the amount he actually owes. So we're not going to give him a discount on the three thousand because he did a return and allowance. So he owes two. So you're going to take 2,000, you're going to multiply that by 2%. We know we're giving him a $40 discount. So that's the discount amount. So how much cash? Well, he owes two. He's getting a $40 discount, so he actually has to pay us $1,960. Now that 40 doesn't go away. We put it into what we call sales discount. And that's the discount. Now... The offset to that is going to be the accounts receivable because we have to go in and show that they no longer owe us anything. Tigger doesn't owe us a penny after this transaction. His account is paid in full. So we need to reduce the account by the full amount to show, hey, Tigger's balance is zero. He's met his obligation. Now that's an example if Tigger pays us within nine days or within that 10-day discount window that we had. What happens if Tigger doesn't? Okay, so notice 2% in 10 days, otherwise the net is doing 30. So what happens if he pays us on day 11 through 30 through 60 or whatever, any point after day 10, so day 11 on? What would happen in that case? Well, we're just outside of the discount window, so what would happen is a straight collection. Uh, Tigger would have to pay the, the full 2,000 here, and then we would reduce the receivable by the full 2,000. Now please keep in mind, you can't have both um, scenarios. Four and five cannot happen at the same time. Either they pay us within the discount window, four, they get the discount, or they pay us outside the discount window and they do not get the discount, which would be number five there. So you have to be careful with that to make sure that you record the proper thing, okay? Those are two independent situations. Obviously, if he pays us on day nine, he will not be able to pay us on the 15th because he's already paid. Okay, so that's just an overview of the accounts receivable, um, life cycle, and a few examples. I do apologize, this is not the best video. It's late, I'm a little tired, but we're trying to get sort of caught up, make sure that you don't get too far behind tomorrow as a result of, of my predicament being stranded here. Not really stranded, I'm in a location. It's not like I'm out in the middle of nowhere, but I am sort of stuck in Pennsylvania for tonight and tomorrow and I won't be back till later tomorrow afternoon. So I apologize for that. Um, hopefully this will get us on the right foot. Plus it may help. You can rewind and replay and watch this as many times as you need to to hopefully make under, uh, make sense of this uh, initial process. And again I apologize that it's not the best video in the world but it, it gives you an idea and at least gets us the basics. So if you have any questions please feel free to send me an email. Um, we'll handle that. Otherwise, I will uh, see you Tuesday. There will be some review sessions I'm going to be at um, on Tuesday. What we'll do is we'll just go over again some journal entries, debits and credits, adjusting entries, and any questions that you have here about the initial life cycle, we can go over in the two to four session. Um, Lindsay will not be able to be there. It will be me. So 
um, keep that in mind. All right. Thank y'all. And I will post this video and I got a couple others I'll post as well for y'all to watch. Have a great Monday.